Well, I'm uh, I'm sitting here with uh, John Jost. Um, he's a filmmaker. Uh, he has two films here in the festival, uh, Swimming in Nebraska, and I'm going to butcher the title, uh, Images <laughs> de Uma Cidade Perdida. It's uh, Images of a Lost City. How's my Portuguese? Uh, pretty bad. Pretty bad? <laughs> yeah, I, I assume so. We just watched that. Um, it's, it's a really, really stunning film, John. Um, it, it's almost like a, um, a travel documentary where you, uh, instead of seeing like uh, tourist spots, you just try to capture the essence and like the soul of a city. Is that is that kind of how you how you feel that the movie uh, the movie is? Well, that, that's what it was after the fact. I, mean, <laughs> I didn't know that I was doing that when I started because I didn't know I wasn't intending to shoot a film, but. Once I decided it was, I was, yeah, I was trying to catch something essentially Lisboenza and Portuguese, where they have a, a kind of way of seeing life, and this film seems to reflect that. And when I shoot in places, I feel a moral obligation to express that place. It's not about me, it's about it. And uh, so when I was there shooting that one, this unconscious desire to be accurate to the place was what happened. Um, you mentioned that you shot all of the footage in like '96 and '97. Um, what made you What made you decide to go back to the project now? Um, well, when I had time, <laughs> you know, and I I knew there was something in the material. Uh, and then I had the time to, because it took time, it wasn't it, it, not an easy kind of thing to edit, it's a yeah. difficult, slow thing to edit, so I needed to have, say, okay, I got a year and I can give part of it to going back and forth looking at this thing. Um, and then my daughter was kidnapped some years ago, and she lives in Lisbon. And somehow this is a kind of gift to her. I I saw that it was I saw that it was dedicated to her, and that seems like that's uh, an interesting and frustrating and uh, I I don't even have words to describe like the kidnapping of, of your child. But uh, do you uh, was it basically just her? It was an inspiration for this. Um, this project, like her living in, in Lisbon, in some way. I mean, I, 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 it, there was nothing, you know, intellectual or whatever. It was sort of, you know, I can't. I, I, she, she comes from Portugal, mm -hmm. and uh, I can't at this point anything Portuguese. Is, reminds me of my daughter. Yeah. So here I had this twelve hours of material sitting there, plus it was shot when she was being gestated. <laughs> you know, she, she was, most of it was shot while we were in, in Lisbon, living in this place while we were waiting for her to be born. And maybe a little bit of it was shot after she was born, but very little. Um, you've, you've been making movies for a long time. Um, you've worked in film and, and now digital video. Um, what was the uh, the transition, transition, like what are some advantages of shooting digital video, and maybe some challenges of shooting digital video. Well, for me, the advantage, well, there's two things. One, I prefer it aesthetically. I prefer the digital video aesthetically because it's much more elastic than working in film. So I don't have, I have no problem with the aesthetic problems. And my last films were in 35 millimeter. People say, "Well, how can you go for 35 millimeter?" This is relatively. And this this film is you know, old DV with with the first DV camera. And you see little jaggies here. Yeah. And they think, "Well, how could you go from nice pristine 35 millimeter and then to this relatively?" And I said, "Well, I could go to it because first it's still damn beautiful." <laughs> And two, it doesn't cost me an arm and leg to shoot yeah. it, right? It doesn't. It doesn't matter what the uh, the grain structure is like if your if your images are well composed. That's, well, yeah, I, yeah. I, I don't think any. I, mean, I look at some of them. I, I think, well, I wish those jaggies on those diagonals weren't there. But 
but most people, A, don't notice them. And even if they do, they really aren't bothersome. And the rest of the image is so beautiful, you just say, okay, just accept this little thing. They have a little camera you can walk around, right? As opposed to 35 millimeter camera, we say, well, can you haul this, this piece of <laughs> brick for me? So the thing of having a little light camera where you can go shoot discreetly, like I did with that one, all those many places in the film where people clearly are noticing me shooting and give the camera a look. But I like those moments. Yeah, the the moment at the in the in the opening shot where the the kid walks up and right, he's so in I the bottom up, corner. <laughs> yeah, and he's talking about how he fucked up the movie. Yeah, that was that was a great a great moment. Um, and also, um, even from that beginning shot, um, where you have uh, the older woman that's sitting on a bench that's slightly. Yep. Slightly at an angle, right. and there's so much going on. There's a street, and there's children congregating around a tree, like on the on the edges. It's such a um, such a strong visual image, um, and and you seem to favor a lot of the ang like angles. Like there's not a whole lot that's completely level. Yep. There's a lot of angular things and a lot of sharp lines. Um, what do you, what do you really look for when you're um, when you're composing an image or when you're looking for your shot? Uh, well, first I'm looking for a, a strong composition. And since I was quite young, I've had an aversion to I mean, a, a photographic image. Uh, most of them, imagine the horizon line is some fixed thing that has to be level. And mine is, no, an image is an image, and it can be like whatever damn makes it the best image, right? And I don't like this, you know, this, you know if the best image happens to be horizontal level, great. Yeah. But, but that often is not the best image of, if you're in a given place. You say, let's take a picture of this. So, and since I was quite young, I, I remember not obeying this this you know we must show everything like your eye sort of wants to see it because your brain will automatically your brain levels everything automatically but an image isn't that it's something else right so i just find i get i think the images are stronger when i when i find the best image and uh but i don't think about it before. Oh, you just, you're naturally a, drawn to like whatever your brain like subconsciously feels is right, and that's yeah. that's what you use. And uh, I mean, some people find it disturbing. Uh, there, there's in in San Francisco, there's a camera obscura. You know what a camera obscura is? Where, where, you know, it's a basically a pinhole camera. And it, and the one in San Francisco does have a lens, and it projects it down on a round table. You're seeing this, the horizon, it, 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 the camera goes in a circle. It's on a gear thing. And it stops at one point, stop. So you're at this big round table, and you'll watch people come in, and there's the people who need to have the horizon level, and they walk around the table as, as the camera moves, because the horizon is just rotating like a clock. And they're the people who, who can't deal with, you know, oh, it's like that. So they'll walk around the table to make sure it's all level. And then there's people like me who love it when it goes upside down. <laughs> it's like, oh, this is fun. Yeah, I'm on a carnival ride, right? So that's, that's, I think it must be something we're socially programmed. You know, there's people who, who want everything conventional. And as soon as it's, I, I remember a long time ago having an artist friend of a, of a filmmaker friend of mine up in Montana asked me why, why I didn't have the camera level in my movies. And she's an artist, and I'm going. <laughs> Look, it's just. You should image. understand this. <laughs> you know, I don't have to have it leveled just because that's the way we see it. But you know, so I, as long ago I went. Well, okay, I guess there's just some of us who don't mind this, and some of us really get disturbed as soon as, you know, we're thrown off level. Yeah. I like carnival rides, right? <laughs> and I like to, I like to sit in the carnival ride and put my eyes straight forward and just let it do whatever it does. Not. It's not to throw out people's perception, it's just how I enjoy seeing things. Yeah. Right? Um, if it throws other people off, 
Fuck you. <laughs> oh, well, the movie may not be for them. One yeah. of my good friends and a filmmaker I liked a lot, James Benning. He's always, horizons are always level. Yeah. I like his films, but then I I, I, I go, boy, if I was him, I'd be bored shitless. <laughs> um, the... Well, I can't pronounce it in Portuguese. Uh, the English translation translation of it is "Images of a Lost City." Yep. Um, what What inspired the title? Why Why images of a, of a lost city? Uh, because that part of Lisbon will 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 either be gentrified and therefore lost, or it is a very it, it is in more ways than one a poor area. So. It's an earthquake zone. Portugal, they had a devastating earthquake in the 1700s. Leveled the city, and they will get another one someday. So I was, it was more like this way of life. This, when I lived there, you would go by and there would be a little old lady uh, uh, in, in a dark, almost cave-like room selling, you know, a few root crops. You know, and that's, that will be gone. Because it's the modern world where, you know, I'm certain if I went back today, that little dark cave she lived in has a glass thing and there's a little boutique there. Right? <laughs> right. So, so that's my, my uh, the lost city was was this very rich, culturally speaking, visually speaking, place which will no longer be in some sense in a very short period. Of time. Yeah, it's probably even changed since it since it was filmed. Oh, for sure. Bit, yeah. I've, been, I've been back and. and it's, uh, well, I'm happy to say that the gentrification, which definitely was tried, there are some places, but it's it hasn't succeeded. <laughs> <laughs> so there's still a lot of the quality that I shot is still there, yeah. which I was surprised at. Your uh, your other film, Swimming in Nebraska, is also playing at the film festival. I think it's playing Saturday Sun uh, or Sunday. 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 Sunday at twelve thirty. Um, I have I haven't seen that, but just from reading uh, reading about the movie uh, online and in our in our programs and things like that, um, it, it sounded like that was kind of a um, a defense of uh, okay, defense of midwestern provincialism. Yeah, a, spe <laughs> a specific a specific lifestyle from uh, from the quote unquote city folk. Yeah. That uh, they like to t talk down on it. Um, what was the what was the inspiration for that? Movie? Uh, I I had an artist residency in Lincoln, Nebraska. I believe because the guy who invited me oh, yeah. kind of knew I was the only filmmaker who would say, "Yeah, sure, I'd like to live in Lincoln." <laughs> you know, most people say, "Fuck, where's Lincoln?" Right? <laughs> you think I'm going to go there? Uh, Anyway, and I, I was born in the Midwest, in Chicago, not exactly, you know, so Chicago's a city. I never, re I've lived on and off little bits here and there, but I like the Midwest and I've traveled in a lot, and I, I find it offensive when, when my East or West Coast friends talk about it as flyover country, or you say, have you ever been in Nebraska, and say, yeah, I drove through it on the way to the Rockies, so they were on I-80, you know. <laughs> Well, you know, you get on I anything, it's the same place no matter where you are. And it can be in Germany or, or the Autobahn in Germany or the one in Italy. You know, there, you know, if you're on one of those, you're on a concrete strip and whatever goes by is a bunch of corporate shit and you don't see where you are. And if you get off on a small road here in Missouri or Kansas or Nebraska or Iowa, you know, this beautiful place full of rich, interesting things. And, of course, if you don't bother to get off the interstate or you fly over it, you don't see this. So, in my film never mentions any of this shit. All it does is show you a, a handful of very interesting things, either in Lincoln or in the immediate surrounding area, just the landscape. Like, oh, it's flat here. Well, actually, Nebraska isn't so flat, right? If you go off, the, you know, if you get off the interstate, it's, it's not really flat. There's flat areas. And flat is nice. It's nice to sit there and say, oh, there's this huge dome of the sky and this horizon line and it seems to go on forever. That's, that's nice. There's something thrilling about it. So my critique was more by showing what was there. Showing there's interesting people. There's 
Is the soil is interesting? If you buy, if you know anything about soil, then soil is interesting. It's not just nothing. It's a very active organic thing that makes gases and you know, does all these things of which you in New York need. Not just the food, but if there wasn't these things putting gases in, you, you're going to choke to death because there won't be any oxygen. <laughs> so it sort of does that. You know, and to me, it's. My original impetus was to criticize these people, but the end film never mentions that. It criticizes them only by default by saying, here's a bunch of things in this place where, silently, you think there's nothing. Um, you, you've said that you've lived in, lived in Nebraska, you've lived in Lisbon, um, you know that you're living in South Korea. Um, what is it that, that makes you that makes you move around so much and, and take in different cultures? Because Nebraska and Chicago are very different cultures. Yep. Um, well, I'm an army brat. So when I was young, every one to three years, it was like, okay, you're out of here and you're in a new place. And uh, I think there's two responses. You're, out, you're like my sister who says, oh, I want security, I want a place, I want to stay in one place, which she didn't get to do, but that's what she wanted to do. Uh, she's been in one place now for 20 years. And, and with me, it's just the opposite. I need to move every three years. I mean, it's like three years is taxing my stay in one place now. So I've lived many, many places for one, one two, three years. I lived in Rome for five years, but it was divided into two, two sections. Um, so I assume I was sort of bred into this bad habit, or in my view, not a bad habit. And um, and then the other thing, my view is, well, you have so much life, and I like to I like to shuffle the deck and see new things. So I like to. Although I know I miss, you know, it's very different. If you live in one place your whole life, you know something that I, I can never know. I accept that. So, well, if you live in a place all your life, you will have an experience and be knowledgeable about things that I could never be knowledgeable about. But in my case, I prefer to say, well, okay, I want to move to India next because it's very different from what I've experienced. What's, uh, what's after after Korea? Well, in theory, I'm on the road here in America for 18 months, shooting uh, a long essay film to go with several others I've made about America in 73 and 87. Um, and then once I'm finished with those 18 months, I'm going to have shot this, what will turn out to be a massive thing if I do it, like nine or 12 hours. <laughs> um, then, um, then I don't know where I'm going. I, 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 all I know is I must go someplace where it's real cheap to live, which does not include the U.S. or Europe. Uh, I haven't and probably won't decide until it's time to, to do it. What What normally uh, takes you from one place to another? Is it is it friends that you've made, or is it just I've always wanted to go there? Uh, it varies. Like, I went and lived in Rome because when I was younger I thought I would like to live in this city and I hit 50 and I told myself if you don't do what you wanted to do you're going to die and you won't have done it. <laughs> so I moved to Italy, I moved to Rome with absolutely no financial whatever, I didn't have much. And I had nothing, to, no, no expectation that there would be something, you know, three months later I was shooting a feature film totally under my conditions, unheard of in Italy. You know, it was, it turned out not to be a nice experience, but <laughs> I did shoot the film. But, uh, and uh, so that was okay. If I don't shoot or I get off the pot, you know, I have to do it. Yeah. And and other times, like I moved to Korea because somebody offered me a job, and I was 64 and I didn't have any money. <laughs> so it was time to 
possibly. Time to grow up. Yeah, time to, time to grow up. <laughs> Get and a real job. And, and then they told me a year later that 65 was the mandatory retirement age in Korea. So I dropped. So they turned me from a college dropout and expellee to a professor in one wave of the bond. And then a year later, they said, well, mandatory retirement age is this. But there's a way around that. Now you're a distinguished professor. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that I, I think is most interesting about you um, is that you're, you're self-taught. And from, from everything that I've gathered, you basically just kind of almost picked up a camera one day and said that you were going to be a filmmaker. And then you were a filmmaker. Um, is that kind of, kind of what happened? Well, how did you get started? Um, I was waiting to be incinerated by a nuclear war during the Cuban Missile Crisis and it didn't happen and I had this $800 that I sold everything to go to New Zealand and rescue myself <laughs> and instead I bought a Bolex and went to Europe and made films. Totally illogical. <laughs> but very fun. And I was never particularly interested in films before that. So, uh, it's, it's very hard. I can't explain it. Maybe you can explain it, but I can't. I, I don't think I can. So you, uh, you said you didn't have an interest in filmmaking. Did you really have an interest in in film before that? No. Not really at all. Like no. even watching films. No. 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 It just was like lightning bolt out of the sky. What? What is it? Do you think that allows you to connect with? with these places and to move around and find a new home and, and get acquainted with the people so quickly? Um, well, I imagine it, that it is the moving around. It's, 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 it's sort of a, an inversion. It's sort of like, because I don't have a home, wherever I am must become home instantly. Like, I, I know people... The, you know, if they if you move them immediately, they're like, oh, this, they're upset. And wherever I go, I'm at home within five minutes. Even if it's a place I've never been to, it's like I just absorb it and say, like, okay. And I uh, I assume that comes from my childhood, where it was like I didn't have a choice. Like, okay, I'm in Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, across the river. I lived there for three years, or I don't remember how long, or too young. <laughs> and suddenly, oh, now you're in Hokkaido, Japan. And now you're in Fort Benning, Georgia. And now you're in Trieste, Italy. And now you're in Alexandria, Italy. And, and... You're almost forced to make friendships. Well, it was sort of like, you, know, you can either be you know, a totally isolated, whatever, or you say, okay, I'm here, this is my new place, and, and I'm comfortable. Or you can recoil and say, oh, I can't stand this. But I guess as a kid, I must have somehow adopted this thing of, of adapting to wherever I am instantly because that was a better survival routine. Yeah. And now, but I think along the way I probably became hyper, like, I, 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 because I, 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 I'm relatively poor, or have been, I am, I consider myself a professional guest. <laughs> and when I walk in somebody's house, I'll know, well, they would like me to be invisible as possible, and I will do that. Or they would like me to be social, or whatever in between that, right? And uh, I, I kind of instantly am able to read, where do I fit in here? What do, what, what do my hosts want? And at a larger level, so culturally speaking, so, okay, I go to a culture I have no experience with, and I, my antenna are like immediately, what do these people want me? And then in filmmaking, that sort of, you know, I've, I've gone to places. To me, the biggest compliment I can get about a film is if somebody from the place that I made the film, whether it's a fiction or, or not, uh, tells me, you got it. I, I remember shooting a film in Butte, Montana, where I only spent three months. And I, I arrived in Butte, because uh, I, I, I picked it because I'd been through there twice and I liked the visuals of it. And I wanted to make a film about high, people in a place where there was high unemployment. And uh, 
So I arrived in Butte and I asked somebody, so where's a bar that I should go to to meet the kind of people I need to meet? Oh, the Silver Dollar Saloon. Okay, so I went to the Silver Dollar Saloon. I sit down on a stool and I order a beer. And the person decided, what are you doing in town? And I said, well, I'm here to make a movie. What about you? I had a free, <laughs> I had a free place to stay that night. Yeah. <laughs> you know? and, and then I made a film with all people from Butte. You know, I, over three months, I, I met people, and, I, and my criteria for being in the movie was not do I think you can act good, but do you want to be in the movie? And they made a film which some people selected as the best film of the year at critics. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, that I could go into a town that I was totally knew nothing about, and immediately, first night, get a place. You know, and, and it must have come from this. This, that I move around, and, and in my own life, my own private life, if, if I have a place to stay, I'm almost a hermit. Uh, I just, uh, which I say, well, it's because usually I don't have a place to stay, so so as soon as I have one, I'll, I'll hole up inside it. It's my little thing. But uh, I imagine that's where it comes from, my childhood upbringing, and then somehow I became very sensitive. So I can read a place that can be completely different. I'm in a place, and I'm going to make something that I want it to reflect that place. Okay? Even though I, I have a very identifiable, peculiar, personal way of something, but it's not about me. And somehow, how do I take this thing I can't not do in me and, and filter it through wherever I am and make it be about it? Well, I have about, I think, 200 hours of tapes, <laughs> which are selected, not, not, not what I shot, not rock but what, what I, what I selected from what I shot, <clears throat> all over everything. I know I could make a feature about nothing but travel, because I have like 15 hours of tapes of just moving around airplanes, you know, Germany, Asia, wherever I was. Um, of other places, I could make another film about this beach town in Portugal because I have many hours of material I didn't use, and another film about film or two about Lisbon. But I don't have an infinite life, so I don't think I will go back and try to make another one. <laughs> are you are you more you're more interested in um, in shooting than editing? Well, I like to edit, but I I like to shoot. Yeah. So. I was able to edit in Korea because I was making some money and I had time and I didn't like shooting in Korea. <laughs> I feel defeated by Korea. I, you know, I, I couldn't figure out how to shoot. I mean, my students shot nice things and so I was frustrated because like, well, how come they can see it that way and I don't see it that way? There were many interesting things I could easily make a film about in Korea. Social things or social structures. One thing about being an outsider of my kind, because I've traveled around a lot, I can usually very quickly see things in a society that people inside it don't see. Usually when I tell them the first time, they say, oh, you're full of shit, that's not the way it is. And if I go on, then they'll say, well, you're, actually, you're right. <laughs> usually not very nice things, right? So Korea has a lot of not nice things, which I, discuss, I saw, and the people there, you know, they don't want to see it, so they don't see it. They experience it, but if you if you come in as an outsider, you, I had an experience in Italy. I was, in Italy, I, I, I was very much liked by the critics, and they loved it when I ripped America apart, right? <laughs> There's nothing more fun for them for me to criticize America. So I go to Italy and I make an Italian film. So they didn't think I was going to treat Italy nice. I, so I made this critical film in Italy, and they're, oh, how are you fucking poor? You don't understand anything. <laughs> and, you know, my script had been, I had collaborated with a, 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 a known Italian writer, and all the things that were really about Italy were written by him. The film I made proved to be horribly accurate about Italy and Italians, you know, which you know, belatedly, 15 years later, they admitted, yeah, you were right. <laughs> this is how we are and what it is.
so that for me that was a chastening experience because I w on one level I was very naive and I just didn't I didn't you know I thought oh they love it when they they like my films but no they only like my films when I'm attacking America not, not, you know suddenly I'm in Italy and you thought well do you think I would make Roman holiday or something like this some nice little of first American piece. version of Italy yeah. so so that was uh, an in so the same thing happened in Korea where but I wasn't making a film. I, I had graduate students, uh, women who were being under this incredible pressure to get married in Korea. And the thing is, it's a Confucian society, and there is no, they don't have social security there. They don't have any safety network. The safety network is your family. So if you're a woman and you don't get married by the time you're 30, they think there's something wrong with you. Lesbian or something like that. And then they throw you out of the family, and then you have nothing. So you have to get married. If you get married, then your husband will take care of you until you die. But you have to take care of his family until they die. And meanwhile, because of the Korean business things, Korean Korean office hours go from ten in the morning till around eight in the evening, but then there's the after office hours where you must go out with the office people and eat and get drunk. So these women are getting, you know, marriage includes my husband is going to be out until whatever hour he comes back, you know, more like one or two. Right? <laughs> and he might have gone to the salon room where there's a love motel around the corner with the young girl who's the bar woman, but in fact the prostitute. Uh, and that's, you know, you kind of, if the boss is doing that and you're who steps down on totem pole, you got to do it, peer group pressure. So that's the reality. Then. When I would describe it to these women from very, I was taught at a very high class university, and so these people came from good families, I would say, well, here's what I saw, and I would say, and, for, and finally they would say, oh, you're right. <laughs> You know, and they didn't, you know, it was like marriage was a poison pill. The ones who had the biggest film had traveled out of the country and seen that maybe it was different elsewhere. So, that would be a story I would be interested in telling. Where are you, uh, where are you up to next with these films? Uh, let's see, I go to Minnesota, and I have something at Carleton College, and... St. Cloud State University, and then I go to Lincoln briefly, and then I go to Stanbury, Missouri. So I go to Buck's place, and I shoot a film for him in early May, a feature. And uh, probably I go back in October and shoot him another one and shoot one for myself. Well, um, thank you for doing this. Thank you for coming to Kansas City again. And